We're going through the Gospel of Matthew, going through the entire Gospel, verse by verse. Uh, this is the first Gospel account that we have. Uh, and by the way, there's only really one Gospel. There are four different writers the Holy Spirit used, but there's one story about Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're, we're finding in Matthew, it's the story of the king revealed, the king rejected, and then the king's return. And if you're familiar with the New Testament, you know the theme of the New Testament is Jesus Christ. And uh, the object of the first four Gospels that begin the New Testament, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the object is Jesus Christ. That's the story, amen? And each of these Gospels, these evangelist writers, portrays Jesus in a unique way, uh, very unique to themselves. And I believe the Holy Spirit directed them and used them in particular to give us different emphasis that God wanted us to understand about His Son, amen? Uh, and if you read Matthew, uh, he presents Jesus as the sovereign who comes to reign and to rule among us. When you get to Mark's gospel, he shows Christ as a servant who comes to serve and to suffer. When we read Luke's account, he's the son of man who comes to share and to sympathize. And then when you get to the last gospel, the gospel of John, he tells us he's the son of God who comes to reveal and to redeem. Amen. Four writers and four different emphases, and you can find in the beginnings of their Gospels, uh, because Mark presents him as a servant, Mark has no genealogy at all. Uh, whereas Matthew and Luke do, uh, Mark skips that all together. Why? Because a servant doesn't need a genealogy. You don't need to know where a common servant came from. Amen. And then Luke presents him as the Son of Man, so when Luke does his genealogy, he goes all the way back to Adam, and he tries to show us that Jesus Christ was a man as any other man from the loins of Adam as we've all descended. And then when you get to the Gospel of John, John skips all the human genealogies. He takes us back into eternity past and establishes the eternal essence of Christ and begins this way, In the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, John was telling us he's the Son of God. And Mark was telling us he came as a servant. And Luke said he's the Son of Man. And they were all true. Amen. And as we begin Matthew's Gospel, we found that Matthew is presenting Christ as the sovereign. He's the uh, majestic king. He's the, the one that's sovereign over all things. He presents his great personage as the ruler, the one who has the right to reign, the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised king. And in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 1, verse 1, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, he says this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew is trying to present Christ as the king, the one who has the right to rule, amen, not only through the Jews, but to rule the hearts of all men. And so he goes back through the line of David and uh, that great king, and he wants to show us that he came through the Jewish race and he came through the bloodline of David himself, amen. Do you love the Lord? God is good. And, and so in chapter 1, as we've looked at, we see the genealogy of a king. In chapter 2, Matthew is going to show us the reactions of a king. Amen? He's going to actually, in the first few verses, show us three reactions. One, help me out there, brother, uh, are the reactions of the wise men. The reactions of the wise men. And um, what we're going to find out today is who the wise men really were and um, the fact that they were Gentiles. They came from a uh, a place far away from Jerusalem, far away from Bethlehem. They, they, they were, had no real associations with the Jews. And yet, by the grace and providence of God, God led them to Bethlehem and led them to worship the King, to worship the Messiah. And we're going to find out in that, that if you really want to worship God, God will lead you to Himself. Amen. A lot of people say, well, I, I can't find the Lord, and I can't get close. If you want to know Christ, God will provide an avenue for you to know Christ. Amen? We see that also in Herod. For Herod was a, well, actually his title was king of the Jews, and he wasn't Jewish either. But he reigned and ruled among those people for almost 50 years, but he never came to faith in God. 
And so we see the wise men afar away, not connected, and yet they came, and they found somehow, through the grace of God, the desire to worship Christ. And we see Herod right there among them, but he denies Christ and holds on to his selfish lifestyle. We also find the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people who although he came to them, they totally missed him. The Bible said he came to his own, and his own received him not. And so we're going to see three different reactions. Let's look at Matthew 2 and 1. Look at the first couple verses here. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. And they said this, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now the first question from these first couple verses is, why Bethlehem? And, and by the way, it says Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, and that's uh, uh, giving some differentiation between the Bethlehem that was in Galilee. And so the writer says, in Bethlehem of Judea, and here's a picture of uh, Bethlehem. And if you can tell, it's a very hilly area. They build their houses out of the limestone, uh, which the earth is made of. And so you can't really tell where the house begins and the earth ends. And, and it all kind of blends in together. It was a fruitful area. In fact, it was called the house of bread. Uh, Beth means house. Lehem means bread. And how many of you know the bread of life came from Bethlehem? Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. It was a fruitful area. It was a blessed area. And there was quite a bit of uh, Bible history around the area of Bethlehem. If you remember, Jacob's wife, uh, Rachel, died there, and he buried her there, and he put up a marker. And we're studying on Sunday nights the book of Ruth, and Ruth was from Bethlehem, and she married Boaz, and, and she became the great-grandmother of King David. But the most important thing about Bethlehem is Bethlehem was David's home. That was where Jesse, his father, was from, and that was where David was born at, and that was where the line of the Messiah, the bloodline of the Messiah, was going to come through the house of David and through the line of David. And so it's at Bethlehem. And we must ask ourselves the question, who are the wise men? Now, sadly, what we know most about the wise men comes from not theology, but Christmas cards, amen, and Christmas programs. How many wise men are there, church? Tell me. Did you know that's nowhere in the Bible, uh, that there are three wise men? There's a lot of things that have been thought about the wise men and said about the wise men, but we know very little. In fact, a man named Vincent, who wrote some word studies about these things, had this to say, and this is a quote. He said, many absurd traditions and guesses respecting these visitors to our Lord's cradle, have found their way into popular belief and into Christian art. They were said to be kings and three in number. They were said to be representatives of three families of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and therefore one of them is pictured as an Ethiopian. Their names are given as Caspar, Belziar, Melkar, and their three skulls, amazingly enough, are said to have been found. Yes, they were found in the 12th century by Bishop Renaud, of Cologne. And so we developed all these theories and we made three wise men and we gave them names and we decided who they were. And this Bishop of Renaud said he found their skulls. Now, folks, if you dig up a skull, how would you know it was the wise man's skull? Amen. Maybe their eyes were still in the sockets pointing toward Bethlehem. I'm not sure. But in Europe, they actually have an exhibit, a priceless casket, where you can go in and see these three skulls, and they say they're the skulls of the wise men. I'm going to tell you, folks, you better get back to the Bible if you want to know what really happened and what's really true. There's a lot of things that spring up as theory but are not uh, biblical. Now, let me tell you something about the wise men. The original word in the Greek is, is magi, or magi. Uh, Majoy, as you see there on the writing. And the word was really an untranslatable word. It's the word from which we get our word magician. Now, when we think of a magician, we think of someone doing tricks and, and pulling rabbits out of hats, and it has kind of a negative connotation, but it didn't have that back then. Who were these magi? They were actually a priestly tribe. They were among a group of people, a very large and populous group of people called the Medes. Have you ever heard of the Medes and the Persians? And they, their empire was over in the east there. You see, there was Palestine, and, uh, and then off to the west was the Roman Empire. To the east were these eastern people, and among them were the Medes. They were a, a tribe among the people of the Medes. Now, if you're familiar with the uh, Hebrew race, there were 12 tribes. And one of those tribes God chose to be the priestly tribe. Do you remember that? 
He chose the, he chose the tribe of the Levites. And he picked them and chose them and said, they will be priests unto me. And they served God and they served at the tabernacle and they served at the temple. Well, these magi were much like that. They were a tribe among these Medes and they were chosen to be the priestly tribe. Now, what were their giftings? They were devoted to astronomy, to a religion, to medicine. They mixed some in astrology, some, uh, if you read about them, uh, some occult working, some sorcery. And their location was, as I told you, they were mainly in the east, but they really permeated uh, the known world at that time. They had great political power. They were held in high esteem by the Persian court. They were admitted as counselors. They followed the camps in war to give advice. And uh, they literally became the kingmakers of that day. In fact, the eastern kings could do nothing without the approval of of these magi. Uh, they wrote the law of the Medes and the Persians and everything had to be done by that law. And if you read the writings about these people, no king could be appointed unless that king was approved by this priestly tribe, this group of the magi. Now here's a question. How did they come to know about the Messiah? Well, if you know anything about your Old Testament history, God's people were taken into captivity at one point. Do you remember that? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in 586 B.C., almost 600 years before the time of Christ, came along and he uh, took Judah, took Israel, and the Bible says he made many of them captive and took them back into Babylon. And when that happened, uh, these Medes, this priestly tribe, were in great influence and great power in Babylon. And so when all these Jews came into the kingdom, they were influenced and had interrelations with the Jews. One of those Jews was a man named Daniel. How many of you know of Daniel? Amen. Remember when Daniel as a young man came into Babylon, when he first came into the court, they began to train him because he was very smart, him and some of his friends, and they were going to use him in leadership in the kingdom. And if you remember right off the bat, Daniel said, I can't eat the king's meat. I can't drink the king's wine because it's against my belief in God. They gave him water and vegetables. And uh, the Bible says Daniel prospered more than all those around him. And so God had his hand on Daniel from the beginning. Amen. Put that up there if you would. Help me out there, my friend. Consequently, they... These Medes, these, this priestly group became familiar in the dispersion of the Jews with Jewish prophecy regarding Babylon. Now, Daniel was counted as one of these wise men. You say, preacher, who were the wise men? Did you know Daniel was one of these wise men? How do you know that, pastor? In Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, in his second year of his reign, early on in the process, had a dream. And in this dream, the Bible said he saw this great figure of a man made out of different materials, and it greatly troubled him. Now, when this happened, the Bible said he immediately called for the Magi, these astrologers, these Chaldeans, these soothsayers, to come in and interpret the dream. Now, you say, preacher, who were these wise men? They were the ones that the king called when he had a difficult problem, when there was some issue in the kingdom he needed counsel on. He immediately called the Magi. And he said to them, I've had a dream, and I want you to interpret it. How many of you ever had a dream, and, and you told someone, and they said, I wonder, and they gave you some help on maybe what it meant. Anybody ever been there? Well, that's what the king said. But this is what the, the, the wise men, they said. They said, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. That makes sense, amen. The king said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell it to you. I want you to tell me the dream. And by the way, if you want a real interpretation, that's probably the best way to go, amen. I'm not going to tell it. You tell me the dream and then you tell me the interpretation. They said, nobody can do this. He said, if you don't do it, I'm going to cut you to pieces and I'm going to turn your houses into dung hills. Well, that was a bad day to be a wise man, amen. And, uh, and so they, they said, King, we can't do it. It's impossible. And in Daniel 2.13, it says this, And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. You see, he said, I'm going to kill all the wise men. And the Bible says Daniel and some of his friends were also counted in the number of the wise men. And when they brought Daniel in, if you remember, God worked through Daniel. Daniel interpreted the dream for the king. And it tells us down in verse 48, 
Then the king made Daniel a great man, gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Did you hear that? You say, preacher, who are these wise men? They're this priestly tribe, this, this group called Magi, and the Bible said they were very active in the kingdom of Babylon. They were king makers. They were king's counselors. And the Bible says Daniel was one of them. And at the end of chapter 2, the Bible says Daniel was put in charge of all the Magi that were in the land of Babylon. Isn't that something? Well, I think it's something. Say amen. Praise the Lord. You're either listening or stunned. I can't tell which one. Amen. Daniel 4.9, uh, over in the fourth chapter, about 30 years later, if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. He calls Daniel again. Look at verse 9. That's Daniel's uh, name given in Babylon. O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. So we find uh, back in chapter 2, Daniel's put over all the wise men. In, in Daniel chapter 4, about 30 years later, he's still master of the magicians. He's the one that's in charge of them. He's the one that's training them. In fact, I believe Daniel became famous. If you look at chapter 5, this is in the kingdom of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, a man named Belshazzar. It says in Daniel 5 and 11, after, remember what happened to Belshazzar? He was showing off in a big party, and he asked for all the holy uh, elements to be brought in, the cups and the bowls that were taken out of the temple when his granddaddy Nebuchadnezzar raided the temple. And they brought the cups and the bowls in. They poured wine in them. They drank wine out of the holy articles from the temple. They praised the gods of wood and stone. And you remember what happened? God didn't take that very well. And the Bible said a hand came out of nowhere and began to write, on the plaster of the wall in the great palace hall where they were partying. If you want to know something that will kill a party, let a hand show up. Amen. You can't hardly party through that. Amen. Woo -woo. Oh, my. And, um, and the party came to a screeching halt. Belshazzar, I love the, the old writing of the Bible, says he came loosed in his loins. That means his knees started knocking together. He became terrified. He saw this hand right on this writing. They didn't understand the writing. So what do they do? They immediately called the wise men. What are you telling me, Pastor? These wise men were the king's counselors. They were the ones that were right there in the inner circle, very powerful. No one could help the king. The queen mother said, I remember a fellow. Now, this is years after Nebuchadnezzar. Why is Daniel kind of out of the suit? Because when a new king came in, they kicked out the old wise men. Why do you think that was? Well, number one, if you was a wise man, you probably should have predicted it was getting close for him to die. Amen. And if you were real good, you probably could have helped him not die. And so when he died, they got rid of you, got some new fresh wise men in there. But Daniel's kind of retired. But when this great problem comes up, none of the new wise men can solve it. And so what do they do? The queen mother says, now listen, listen. There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, who the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpreting. J Daniel's so famous that years later, when he's kind of retired, when a big problem comes up, they bring him up, they call him out again. Folks, God used Daniel in such a powerful way that he actually ran the wise men in the land of Babylon. Now listen to me, someone that famous, I, I bet you he made an impression on everybody he was around. When a guy can tell you the dream and tell you the interpretation, that'll get your attention, amen. When a guy gets thrown in a lion's den and the lions ain't hungry no more, that'll get your attention, amen. Everywhere Daniel went, the power of God and the favor of God was on him. And so here he is, this godly Jewish man in front of all these pagan wise men, and he's teaching them. What do you think he taught them? I bet he taught them the ways of God, amen. Uh, why? Because even when they told him not to pray or we'll throw you in the lion's den, he prayed anyway. He, he never backed down from what he believed about his God. And remember when they threw him in the lion's den, remember what King Nebuchadnezzar did? He said, oh God, uh, oh Daniel, thy God whom you serve is able to protect you. He had so influenced the kingdom that they believed that, that he knew God, that he had some connection with God. 
Now listen to me, I believe there were a lot of converts that Daniel made among those wise men. I believe there was a lot of people under Daniel that, that saw so much in him and heard what he said and turned to the living God. Amen? Now this was about probably 550 years before the birth of Christ when all this was going on. How many of you know God can influence history? Do you know that? That God sets up things in advance. God plans things in advance. And the Jewish influence of the, on the Gentile peoples. Remember, when the Jews went in captivity, church, when they came home, only a small number came home. Do you know that? Most of them stayed in captivity, living where they were living. And those Jewish people, they built synagogues, and they worshipped in those towns, and they had influence on those cultures. And many of the people around those Jewish people, hearing the stories of their God, watching those godly people live out their lives day by day, converted to Judaism, converted to serving God. Amen? How do you know that, Pastor? Well, in Acts 10, 1, we read this. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, which was a man over 100 soldiers of the band. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's another group of soldiers, 400 to 600 soldiers, called the Italian band, men from Italy. He was a devout man. He was one that feared God with all of his house. He gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Here's a Gentile man. He's not Jewish. He wasn't raised in the faith, but he'd been influenced somehow by the Jewish people and the Jewish God, and the Bible said he was a devout man. He feared God. He he gave to folks in need. I'm going to tell you the Jews had influence on a lot of souls. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying one godly life can have an impact. One person living for God and clinging to God and honoring God can have impact on those around them. Don't you give up, Christian friends. Sometimes the devil will make you, oh, there's no use. I'm not making a difference. You're making a tremendous difference if you're living for the Lord. You're making a tremendous difference if you're being faithful to God. You never know who's watching. If y'all give me another 30 minutes, I'll start preaching. It's about to get here. Amen. It just took a while today. Now listen, we also read in Acts 16, 14, remember the apostle Paul on a missionary journey. It says, uh, he goes down to a river and some ladies are praying. These are Gentile women. And it says a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. She attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Here's some Gentile women going down to the river, praying to God. They didn't know the, the Jewish God, but they were influenced by others. And they cried out and had a faith in God. So I believe God influenced some of these magi. They got saved. Everybody say saved. Say, preacher, how'd you get saved in the Old Testament? The same way you got saved in the New Testament. By faith. Amen. They looked forward to the cross. We look back to the cross, but everybody gets saved by faith. Nobody gets saved on anything else. Amen. They put their faith in God, and I believe some of these magi, some of these wise men, believed Daniel. It was passed down through their families. They cling to that hope. He had told them a Messiah. See, I believe what you live today can have generational effect. See, I have full confidence if uh, my children get married and have children, they're going to pass on what they've learned. Amen. They'll probably be big eaters too, just like the Adkins said. They'll, they'll pass on the faith. They'll pass on the confidence we have in Christ because we've shared it with our children. They'll share it with their children. That's how you build a legacy that follows after God. And so I believe some of these magi under Daniel got saved and they were so convinced of the reality of his God, they clung to him, they passed it to their children, they passed it to their children. And 600 years later, see if the world stands another 600 years, I have no idea. But if it stood another 600 years, I hope there's a descendant in my family that knows God somewhere, amen, that is clinging to righteousness. Why? Because way back down the line, uh, Papa Adkins and Mama, uh, I don't even know what to call her. Uh, she's upstairs. I'll call her what I want. Mima Adkins, and, and, uh, and, and they had faith in God, and they passed it down. Don't you dare think what you do doesn't matter. Don't you dare think bringing my children to church doesn't matter. Praise God. I believe there were good magi and bad magi. There's always good and bad of everything. Mm -hmm. Some people cling to God and some people rebel. In the same family, some will cling to God and some will turn the other way. 
the same home, raised under the same principles. Some will, will grab and gravitate to God, and some will walk the other way like they never heard. So I believe some of these magi, these wise men, cling to what Daniel said and had faith in Daniel's God. But some of them didn't. How do you know that, preacher? We'll put this up there. Remember when, when Philip goes to Samaria preaching the gospel, a revival breaks out? You remember that? And there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city, you sorcery, bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out himself that he was some great one. I believe he's one of these magi that went the wrong way, that used what he knew to, to manipulate. Friend, you can use what you know to manipulate people. There are preachers and teachers that manipulate the people of God, getting them to do what they want them to do. Amen, preacher. And there are some people that just declare the gospel. There's always on both sides of the fence, but this fellow went bad. He's using his, his gifts and his abilities for the wrong thing. And the Bible says when Peter and John come to Samaria, they begin to lay hands on folks, and folks begin to receive the Holy Ghost. What does that mean, Pastor? I believe that means they begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. Now, some people say that, 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 that isn't what happens, but if you notice, when Simon saw, everybody say saw, he saw with his eyes through the laying on of hands that the Holy Ghost was given. Now, how could you see someone get the Holy Ghost if there was no outward manifestation to it? If it's something just in your heart, there'd be nothing to see, would there? They would have just said, receive the Holy Ghost. They'd have said, I receive the Holy Ghost, and there's nothing to see. But he saw that they received the Holy Ghost. Amen. You know why? Because I believe they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. You said, preacher, I don't understand that. There's a lot of things about God you're not going to understand. And you know why a lot of people rebel against the thought of speaking in tongues? Because when you speak in tongues and you worship in that matter, you are not in control fully. God comes on you and God begins to work through you. And suddenly uh, you feel strange things and you're acting a little different and you're out of your comfort zone. I'm going to tell you, God wants to get a hold of all of your life from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. He wants to be in charge of your life. I'll never forget my wife's brother years ago. We were at Bible college, our first Bible college together. and He was very prim and proper and he was very dignified, and he didn't like to do anything out of the way. And so he would never seek the Holy Ghost because he was afraid of what would happen to him, you know. I'll never forget, we were in a great service there at the campus on uh, Thomason College, and the Lord was moving. And I looked out of my peripheral vision, and there came my wife's brother. His name's Jeff, and the Lord was hopping him down the aisle. He looked the funniest thing i ever seen in my life. And it wasn't a normal hop. He was kind of turned sideways, and he was hopping like this. And God hopped him all the way down front and hopped him back and forth down front. I'm going to tell you, don't ever tell God what he ain't going to do in your life. Amen. But you know what? He got tired and said, I don't care what you do to me. I need all of you. I need your fullness in my life. You see, you can stay in charge of your life or you can let the Holy Spirit be in charge of your life. Amen. And if you're going to give the Holy Spirit charge of your life, his, his way is his way. My own blessed mother, I'll never forget, we had a great revival down in Charleston. My mother was very, very timid and very uh, to herself. She didn't read well. She was... Uh, even nervous going to Sunday school classes because they might ask her to read, and she didn't have a whole lot of formal education. After I moved out of the house after college, she went back and got her GED and got a job, and she was so proud of herself. But for years, she struggled with that shyness, and, and we had a great revival, and the evangelist said, if you want the Holy Ghost, uh, get in line right here. And, and my mama, scared to death, embarrassed, got in that line. And I'll never forget it, and I was praying. She was walking down because I knew how she was. Before she ever got to the preacher, she was already speaking in tongues. The Holy Ghost fell on her and blessed her, and she was in the line, and, and God was just working through her life. I'm going to tell you, you've got to make up your mind. I want God in charge. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I act like. I'm going to tell you, a formal, dead, dry religion will not keep you in the hour of need. It will not get you through the hour of temptation. You need the power of God in your life. And this man saw the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the Bible said he offered him money and said, I'll buy it. I want to buy that power. <laughs> Ooh, if you could buy that power, wouldn't it be something? Now, they published books, I think, uh, uh, seven words to receive the Holy Ghost, or seven steps. There ain't no seven steps. It's get right with God. Amen. And it's put your faith in God. It's, it's, it's ask God to help you. It ain't glory, glory, glory. And uh, sometimes the Pentecostals, we get around people and say, uh, let him in. Uh, keep him out. Let him. People don't know what to do. Amen. We say, let go, hold on, let go, hold on. What do y'all do? Praise God. 
One fellow was at a Pentecostal church said, I want to get saved, but I dread the experience. Amen. I, I'm just scared to death to go down there. They're going to tell me to hold on and let go and hold on and let go. He said, if I could just have that power. I, you know what? He was wanting to manipulate people still. Now, he'd gotten right with God according to the scripture, but now that same spirit that I'll manipulate people, I'll use this for my gain. Remember what Peter said? He said, you let your money perish with you. You can't. He said, you're in the gall of bitterness and, and iniquity, and if God don't help you, friend, you ain't going to make it. Amen. But see, there's a man that went bad. There's another one. Put it up there real quick. Uh, you know the story. Uh, Paul and Paul's on his missionary journey, and they're on the island of Cyprus. It says, when they'd gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. Uh, and, and it says his name was Elymas, the sorcerer. That's his name by interpretation. Withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy, uh, Sergius Paulus, from the faith. Um, and, 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 and remember what Paul said? He said, you're full of all subtlety, full of all mischief. You're a child of the devil. You're the enemy of all right. Boy, they didn't mince words, did they? Sometimes you better call a devil a devil. Don't invite him up to pray. Woo, that'll preach somewhere later. Amen. Is it cold in here or is it just me? Man, I, just, I was just sitting here thinking, I am freezing. I don't know why I'm freezing so much. You know, I, listen, I'm trying to preach. Don't, don't let me lose my train of thought. I was trying to, trying to zero in on the Lord, and I realized I... <laughs> Praise God. I don't know why we have the air conditioner on in the middle of winter. I, ain't, I still don't understand it. Folks, we don't know how to control this thing. I'm just going to tell you. We do things to it, and nothing helps. I don't know. It's just going to be cold, so just pray for our whole church. Amen. And I've... <laughs> I've told you, I think if we get low on funds, we're going to hang meat in here during the week and <laughs> let it be a slaughterhouse. But um, so we see, <laughs> we see these wise men that went bad and they used their, their, their abilities for bad. See, do you understand what I'm trying to teach you? There were some Gentiles who were touched of God and they drew to God and some went their own way, went into paganism, went into dark. That's always the way. But I believe these wise men somehow Cling to God. Praise God. Praise God. Now, let me, let me close out with this. Who are these wise men? Number one, the numbers. We don't know. You know, we, we, they could be three. The Bible never tells us. Some people, maybe a dozen or more of them. We do know that these, these folks didn't ride camels. They rode Arabian steeds. They were the king makers. They, when the king had a problem, who was the first person he called? Why? They were powerful folks. And when they came, they usually came with the, the best guard of the Babylonian or, or empire or wherever they were traveling from. And so they'd come with maybe as many, some believe, as a thousand military. So now we got maybe a dozen guys on Arabian steeds, a thousand more military in full uniform on Arabian steeds. Folks, when they, that group of people rode into town, I bet it got everybody's attention, don't you? Three guys on camels probably wouldn't stir a whole lot of folks. But if you saw a whole group of Persian kingmakers, a thousand or more, riding into town, it would get everybody's attention. The Bible said when Herod saw it, he was troubled. He wouldn't have been troubled at three men on camels. But when he saw Persian kingmakers roll into town, and by the way, Persia was without a king at that point. They had a king named Phrytus. He was a, he was a failure. They had, they had pushed him off the throne. They were looking for a king. And so these eastern kingmakers come rolling into town saying, where's the king? I bet you that got everybody's attention. Preacher, why are you telling me all this? I want you to understand who they are. I believe they were influenced by Daniel, and I believe 600 years later, God stirred up what he gave them. And the Bible said he revealed his glory, and we're going to talk about that. We won't do it this morning, but he saw the star. And listen, I don't think that star was a star at all. I believe it was the glory of God. Why do you say that? Remember when in Luke, when the shepherds were out in the field, what's it say? The angel showed up, and what did it say? The glory of the Lord shone round about them. All through the Bible, the manifestation of God is light. Amen. In the Old Testament, there was a cloud of light that led the children of Israel by day. At night, it became a pillar of fire. It was the glory of God among his people. When Moses went up on the mountain, remember what happened? The light, the glory of God shone on his face so bright. When he came down, they had to cover his face with a veil because they couldn't look on his, the glory on his countenance. 
Remember, remember when, when Paul was on the road to Damascus and the Bible said a bright light, brighter than the noonday sun, appeared in there and knocked him down and blinded him. When God showed up, it was glorious light. The Bible said when Solomon dedicated the temple to the Lord that the glory of God showed up in a fire and a bright light. People couldn't even get in there. The, the glory was so, so amen. And I believe when those shepherds were out there, the glory of God showed up in the brightness of light. So I believe what they saw was the glory of God. The word in the Hebrew is astar. It could mean several different things, but I believe it was glory. They said we saw it in the east. Now, they didn't follow it the whole time. That's what we see on the shows. They followed this star. That, that was, they saw the glory in the east. They knew the prophecies of Messiah. They headed to Bethlehem because they knew that's where he'd be born. And the Bible said when they got out of their meeting with Herod, do you remember what happened? They saw the star again and they rejoiced. It showed up again. The glory was there again. Now, here's the big question if you're a thinker. Why didn't everybody else see this glory? If it was the glory of God and the, these folks saw it and, 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 and they rejoiced, why didn't everybody see this glory? I went back. Remember when the children of Israel, this last thing I'm going to say, went to the Red Sea? The Bible said the Pharaoh and his army trapped them. Do you remember that? And the Bible says the angel of the Lord showed up. That's, that's, the, that's Jesus. He shows up in his glory, and he's in the form of the cloud because it's daytime. And he says the cloud went behind the children of Israel in between them and the Egyptians. It said, and when, when Israel looked at it, it was light, but for the Egyptians, it was darkness. You see, the same glory, one person saw it as light, the other person saw it as darkness. Amen. I'm going to tell you God's glory is such that if you know God, it'll show up. Amen. You'll see it, you'll understand it, you'll know about it. But if you're in dark, friend, I've seen people under the power of God in a powerful service sit there like a bump on a log. You ask them, how was church? I don't know. Because you're in darkness. You don't even see his glory. But I've had other folks in a service that felt like we was all bumped. Well, ice cubes in a tray is what I'm going to put for our church. Amen. Felt like ice cubes in a tray. I'm going to fix this. I'm about to die. My heart's breaking for you folks. This is not going to happen again. We're going to figure out a way. It may be hot next week, but not like this no more. Oh, thank you. Praise God. It's wearisome. I'm moving and can't stay warm. Praise God. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I've seen people when it was like a, everything's cold and someone gets happy. The glory starts hitting them. And you look over, man, what are you doing? And why? Because they saw some glory. They felt some glory. Other people around them, a little cold, a little indifferent, but they uh, found the glory of God. You see, I think these wise men heard of the stories of Messiah, saw his glory, and said, let's go to Bethlehem. God began to work with us. Don't you know it embarrassed all the people of the Jews when Gentiles showed up saying, where's your king? They didn't know where he was. They didn't know he'd been born. Gentiles from another land, God had to lead them. He came to his own. His own received him not. God's going to be worshipped, though. <laughs> Woo, how many of you know that? I mean, uh, remember, remember when, hey, men, remember when they were coming into Jerusalem? Remember that? They were coming into Jerusalem, and then the people began to praise him, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. And the religious folks said, tell them to hush. Religion don't like praise. It makes them nervous. Amen. He said, tell them fellas to hush. You remember what Jesus said? He said, if these hold their peace, the rocks are going to cry out because somebody's going to worship me. Somebody's going to give me praise today. You see, they, the Jews said, we don't know him. God raised up Gentiles 600 years earlier, brought them from across the way, brought them in. Where's the king? We have come to worship him. You see, Matthew's telling us a king was born. Everybody missed it, but God knew a king was born. And he rose up these people to bring them in. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying God's going to be praised. God's going to be worshipped. The only question is, will I be a part of that? Will I be a part of what God's going to do in the earth? I want you to stand with me. Amen.